Hello. I know it's going to be a, a small group. Uh, last session of the day is always a horrible session. I see one. <laughs> Come forward, please. Nobody likes global health, it looks like. Have you ever had a lecture just for you? <laughs> this is the first time, right? I love it. Go ahead, come. Come in, come in, come in. No? It's intimidating. Yeah. Mm -mm. Well, go ahead. Let's go ahead. Right. No. Yeah. Come forward, don't yeah, worry. You want to come up here so you don't have to. Wow, well, that's all right. We might be done then, too. We don't yeah. have a lot of audience. Sarah, do you want to see if there's anybody else outside? Just Yeah, yeah. Thank thanks. You. All right, so, go ahead, Dr. Kumar. Okay, so our lecture, like, we'll keep it really informal uh, since we only you are here and us. So I think uh, uh, the, the premise of this, this lecture is basically uh, inequalities in global health uh, research, and mainly in global emergency medicine research. So I've been a practicing, uh, practicing physician from, that, from uh, the Global South, trained in the Global North, and then go back to the Global South to practice, and I realize that like, ethics in, in research uh, is, is a different ball game in, in the north and the south. So we got together uh, a group of us and we tried to come up with an idea of uh, how to approach this topic. And I think uh, we, we reached out, we have contributors for this. Uh, we have myself, Pax, Dr. Paxton, Gales Catamol, Simone French, Evelyn Haiti, Tej Prakash, and Nina. And I'm going to go through each one of them and, and say what their, uh, what their background is. And the objectives uh, for today's uh, talk is basically is going to be uh, describing the lack of standardization currently in global health emergency medicine uh, research ethics. And we're also going to talk about the challenges of how to improve EM research ethics in low and middle income countries. And when I, when I say low and middle income countries, I'm, I'm clubbing low income countries, middle income countries, and lower middle income countries together so that we don't have to go up and down. And also, we're going to talk a little bit about how a working group could address issues regarding global emergency medicine research ethics, and we want to come up with the Delphi model. So uh, we're not going to actually run the Delphi model here. What we want to do is take input uh, from you uh, and, and, and see how we can, we can improve this uh, Delphi model. So Can we put her name on the slide? I we should. Like, <laughs> <laughs> should the credit, it. exactly, yeah. So the, so the way we want to do it is we're going to break it up into two parts. The first part is I'm going to talk a little bit about the background of what we found in the last year's uh, SAM didactic after uh, 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 in-depth uh, uh, literature review. And then we're going to talk about the challenges in emergency medicine research ethics. And then James is going to come back and we're going to do an interactive session. And we're going to take feedback uh, from you about uh, recruiting a working group and also about the questions that we thought would be appropriate for Delphi model. Sarah, feel free to answer oh, yeah. at that time, I think. Definitely. So, uh, um, so here are the, uh, the folks who got together. So it's myself, uh, I'm Dr. Kumar. I'm the Associate Director of the Global Health Research Collaborative. I, I'm the Research Director for, uh, in Harper, and uh, I'm, I, I'm one of the Ethics uh, Vice Chair uh, at our IRB. And then we have James Paxton. Yeah, uh, yep. I'm James Paxton. Uh, I'm a former chair of the IRB at Wayne State University and currently director of clinical research at Detroit Receiving Hospital in Detroit. Perfect. And, and uh, then we have uh, our international uh, authors. Uh, we have Giles Catermol, uh, who is a consultant in emergency medicine from King's Hospital, London. Uh, and he does a lot of work in Rwanda. He does a lot of work in Ghana. He does a lot of work in, in Vietnam. Uh, we have Evelyn Haiti, who is the chairperson of emergency medicine uh, from uh, AUB, American University of Beirut a Medical Center. And then we have Simone French, who is the program director for emergency medicine at University of West Indies. Uh, we have Tej Prakash, who is the co-director for the WHO Collaboration Center in uh, India, uh, in uh, uh, New Delhi. He's also an additional professor uh, at Ames. And then, uh, and then we have uh, uh, Nina Encheva, who, without whom this could not have been done. I think she's our uh, a student. Uh, she was an undergraduate when she joined our collaborative, and now she's a student at uh, UFM, uh, doing a, a public health uh, undergraduate. Uh, graduate. So starting to talk about ethical concerns. So anyone who does research knows that uh, conducting research has a bunch of ethical concerns. So you have issues with language. You have issues with recruitment. Uh, then we have issues with equity. 
Uh, we have issues with consent. I think that's a big issue that we have. We have issues, uh, issues with uh, monitoring risk of health to participants. Uh, you have issues with uh, research participant relationship, autonomy, uh, uh, minimizing harm, and, and uh, serious concerns, uh, and safeguarding. So uh, these are all issues that we know are there, but, and, but some of them are very specific for uh, the research that's done in low middle income countries. And then there's a little bit of uh, uh, differences in which how they approached both here and in, in LMIC. So, so based on that, uh, th these are some of the point, uh, issues that we thought are more uh, challenging in LMICs and, and uh, in the global south. Uh, the, one of the big one is the risk benefit assessment and standard of care for participants with elevated baseline risk. So I think when, when uh, you approach a patient in low middle income countries for research, I think there's a blur, there's a, there's a really blurred line between a clinician and a researcher because I don't think they truly understand research at, at, per se. I think everybody is, if you're a doctor and you're doing research, you're still a clinician first and, and then a researcher. So I think that, like if you tell them that you want the, them to be a part of the study, that line gets a little blurred. I think they, they assume that you're gonna do only good for them. So uh, it might not be the case. I think the study could have bad outcomes. So I think explaining to that and making sure that they understand the risk benefit is very important. Uh, again, blurring the roles of clinician researchers. Then there's uh, absent traditional peer review. I think that's, it's changing hopefully uh, as we move along uh, with the requirements for more peer review uh, happening in, in LMIC in the global south, but it's there. And especially if you go more rural, I think uh, uh, you will see that it's, it's happening more. Um, population with intersecting vulnerabilities. Uh, fair participation selection, I think that's a big one. Uh, I think uh, sometimes, uh, when you go, like I, I've done community research and then I've gone to the, uh, the, the panchayat, we call the panchayat as the village leader, and then he'll say, okay, these are the 20 people who are going to take part in your research. He's not asked those 20 people individually whether uh, they, they are interested in being a part of the research or not. He just pulls them all in together as a, as a part of the team. Shama, come in. <laughs> so uh, I think uh, quality of consent is a, is a big uh, factor. I think lack of financial support and resources. I think that's a big reason why research is not conducted uh, much in LMICs is, is uh, you're first a clinician and then there's no funding for doing research. I think, so people try to, if you're doing research, you're, you're most, a lot of them do it from the bottom of the heart, but a lot of them are doing it actually for the monetary gain. So there's some sort of monetary gain that, that they're getting uh, for conducting that research. I think so that, that is, that's definitely an issue when you're, when you're conducting research uh, and the ethics of conducting research in, in the global south. So uh, we did the, uh, the didactic last year, and uh, we did a poll everywhere uh, last year, and we had a representation uh, uh, from India, Haiti, US, Jamaica, and uh, we got some findings from the poll everywhere. I think uh, the, the overall finding was there was a significant barrier in research in LMICs, and uh, the areas for improvement were quality of concern, that's a big one, uh, is, uh, as, as, as I just uh, enumerated, like it's, it's difficult to make sure that they understand uh, the risk-benefit ratio, make sure that the quality of consent is good. Fair participation selection was a big one, blurring the role, as I mentioned, and then distinguishing standard of care from research, as I mentioned, it's, it's really di difficult when you, when you approach a patient in, the, uh, in, in, in a village and you tell them that uh, this is the study that uh, we want to do, they, they assume that you're a clinician first and uh, whatever you say is, is going to work. So it's very important to make them understand the risk-benefit assessment. So th this was, uh, like I, I put the slide out here just to show uh, what, what we truly uh, got from that. I think 100% of them said that we need to make some changes. Um, 50% say, I, I think one of the other questions we try to address is who's going to make the changes? Should the changes come from uh, like an international organization like WHO, or should the changes come from a local organization? Uh, we didn't enumerate exactly what the local organization was. We just wanted to get a feel of what they thought, and actually that was surprising. They said 50% said uh, an international organization, 50% said it should be a local organization. And then the, the last question was, uh, do you think it would be useful to create a working group to address this? And actually that was a, a pretty good idea. Around 67% said yes, there should be a working group to address it. So, Taking that feedback from last year, we decided, okay, let's, let's move forward. Uh, let's move forward, like how, how do we approach this? So the first step is let's come up with a working group. I think uh, the working group idea uh, was put up. Uh, there's, there's challenges to create a working group, how to come up with a working group, and I think James is gonna talk about those, uh, like how we went about creating the working group. So I think before I go on, I think this is basically just uh, reiterating what I said. 67% of them said they want a working group. 
and who should be a part of the working group. I think uh, the, the feedback from last year was highly qual qualified EM clinical researchers who will discuss possible solutions. So we did go a little bit more uh, a deep dive into this and, and we came up with uh, more questions. So you can go ahead from here. So these are the important questions that we thought from last year, but then the answers are, would be from the working group. Yeah, so um, of course you can read the questions, but I think it's worthwhile discussing and explaining them. And, and since we have a small group today, it'd be great if any of you have ideas or thoughts, please speak up. We have a microphone down there and a medical student assistant who can help you get to that. So we'd love to hear your opinions. That's the whole point today, actually. Um, so, so questions that came up in, the, uh, in last year's discussion and, and research survey into this was, uh, the first one was really who, who's commissioning the research? Um, and, and there's different ways of looking at that, but you know, not just like who wants to conduct the research, but who's approving it, who's, who, which regulatory groups are involved. Um, who owns the data that is collected from the research that's done? And then uh, how will the findings be used? And how will the community benefit from that research? These are some important topics that we needed to uh, make sure were addressed properly here. So, uh, so the working group um, that we had proposed to develop for this project was um, the proposal included recruiting what we wanted to be a variety of different um, perspectives, right? And um, I think there's really a danger, especially knowing, I mean, uh, Dr. Kumar and I are both from Detroit, so we're American, we have a certain bias, we have a certain way of looking at the world and looking at research, and we both had a lot of experience with the Institutional Review Board. So we look at things probably differently than someone who doesn't have that background. We wanted to make sure that this working group was representative of you know, the, the diversity that we're hoping to capture. So our aim was to have about 20 participants in this group uh, representing different regions and recognizing that we could have 1,000 people and it still would not be adequate, right? So we can't make a, a, a group that's diverse enough to really get uh, everyone's perspective, but we wanted to try and make an attempt to include uh, a different uh, geographical ranges. So we had representatives from the African continent, from China, the Middle East, Caribbean, Europe, and ideally we wanted to have three uh, people per region, um, at least equal representation as much as possible, recognizing again these are massive areas and you know, three people from Europe, for example, are not all gonna think the same way or have the same background or experiences. Uh, we also wanted diversity in the sense that we wanted a representative sample that included a variety of different uh, roles, if you will. So clinical researcher, editorial board members, IRB, ethics committee members, general laypersons uh, from the public. This is the concept, you know, that everybody's going to have their own way of viewing things, and we wanted everything to be, like, easily interpretable to, for example, the laypersons who don't have maybe research or any clinical background. So it was important to ensure a diverse and representative working group uh, that represented the needs of the different regions and as much as we were able to do. And panels would reach out to colleagues in their respective regions to collect information about um, the perspective of their peers. Um, at this point, we would like to request that you would consider using the poll everywhere. Um, this is a QR code that you can use to uh, access the page. And the reason for this is that what's coming up next are some questions that we've drafted that we'd really love to get your input. Um, we tried to keep it simple. So one thing we want to know is, do you like this question? Does this seem like a good question to you? Um, and that could be yes, no. Um, but if it's no, we'd really love to know what you don't love about it or what you'd recommend to change. And we can certainly um, provide for like you know, text responses and things like that. But with the small of a group, it'd be okay to just speak up and say something that, you know, what's your opinion on this? I promise no judgment here. We're just trying to learn. Um, and Dr. Kumar is going to take copious notes while we're doing this. So he's going to have a lot to, to look at afterwards. Um, I'm going to give everybody a chance. And um, if you guys could just do a thumbs up when you're done either doing it or not doing it, and then I can go on when everyone's had a chance. Is it on the next slide, too? Okay. Did everybody have a chance to see that? Yes? Okay. I'll give you another moment there. Okay. So, uh, working group feedback, poll everywhere questions, uh, things that we're looking for information. What does adequate representation look like? So, uh, what is. Uh, what is adequate, right? I mentioned before we wanted three people from each region, six regions, but like uh, 20 people. 
is that adequate? Is there a way to gauge that? Do you feel that more people or less people would be appropriate? And how would you distribute those um, representatives? Should the working group primarily uh, be driven by researchers or by ethic? ethics committee members uh, or other people, other groups, other, you know, uh, stakeholders in this process. And I think, um, you know, ideally everybody would have equal input, but the reality is somebody has to run the meeting and somebody has to drive the, the effort. So um, it's really a question of should the research side, the people who are doing the, who have the research background be running it or the people who have more of an ethics background. And what should the aim objective of the working group be? what would be a, a good uh, objective in this case. So um, but now some of you may be familiar with the Delphi model of you know, reaching a consensus. And this is something actually we just did yesterday at the consensus conference. You know, this kind of thing ties back in very well. Every year we have a consensus conference and they use a similar derivative Delphi process. Uh, what this involves is kind of defining recruiting experts and then developing some kind of questions um, question about you know, what do you think about this topic, De collecting responses. And so you have round one where all the responses get collected, they get collated, sorted, and then you go through multiple iterative stages where you try to reach some agreement about what's the rank order that these questions or these topics should be listed in. Um, and that may be difficult to do, and it's complicated. You've got to figure out, like, well, what qualifies as, you know, uh, Qualif what, what makes a, a topic qualified to be you know, the most important or the highest priority. And then ultimately your goal is to reach some consensus within the group so that everybody in the group agrees that these, this is the priority, perhaps ranked priority list of things that we want to talk about. Um, and in this setting we have um, uh, some feedback we'd like to get if you, if you have ideas or expertise in the area of the Delphi model. Um, and this is, this is the same, QR code same for same that. QR code. Yeah, it's the same one. But um, so we, any input that you guys have on that, if you have experience on that and you have some suggestions on the process, we'd be glad to hear those. Yeah. Hi, Adam Lee from Hopkins. Hi, Adam. My thumbs are sort of cramping up, so I thought I would maybe. Sure, start. yeah. Um, Thanks. I, I'm thrilled that you put up the Delphi slide because I was like, with, with that initial 20 person working group, I was like, like, I feel like you, you I, I, Delphi sounds like the right answer to yeah. get the breadth that you guys are looking for, you know, because I, I feel like you're going to end up wanting to have input from, you know, 50 or a couple hundred people of different regions, different roles in research or clinical roles, non -clin you know, non-medical folks. Mm -hmm. um, it seems like Adelphi is a really great way of going about that. Mm -hmm. I think that the, like, the working group that drives it, it sounds to me like you probably want people who are mainly researchers and ethicists. Mm -hmm. Because those are the people who actually are, you know, see the importance of doing this and doing it right. Yeah. Um, and you know, I think it's great if you're able to have multinational representation on that mm -hmm. working board. But I, I would, I would imagine it probably it's something like I don't know, maybe half a dozen people that are like yeah. the, the ones who are really the the driving factor, or maybe it's a little bit more. Maybe it's ten people, but like mm -hmm. the people who are really driving this that are going to end up being the authors on the paper, mm -hmm. and then a much bigger. Uh, contingent of, of people who sit on the Delphi panel. Yeah, but I, thank I you. Don't know what others think. No, that's great. That's great input. Thank you. Anyone else have uh, other other thoughts? Yeah. Thank you. I, I think this is what I wanted. I, I just want like a, a discussion. I think the, the more yeah. there's discussion, I think more uh, ideas get generated. Um, I'm sorry, I, was, I worked a little late, but um, when you guys are saying global EM research, are we talking about high income countries going into LMICs? Mm. We're talking like transnational, where countries like LMICs are working with each other. Right. How are we defining the ethics, like the global emergency research in this? Sector? So I, I, it's a great question. I think I think uh, this. We were th when we thought about this, we were not only thinking about uh, transnational, we were actually thinking about local too. So what are the barriers for local researchers to be conducting research? I think, uh, uh, and I think that that's, was a bigger factor, but I think what's happening is because there's so much difficulty in the local researchers conducting research, that's why the transnational research is becoming so important is because we are going and helping and, and trying to facilitate research being conducted out there. But why, why does, it has to be that the Global North has to go down and help the Global South. Why can the Global South not be sufficient itself to be conducting research? I think that, that was the crux of the question uh, to start off with. But again, it's going to take some time for that to happen. And I think one of the big things that we, we see when uh, we, we spoke to researchers from the Global South is, is that the ethic guidelines have been set by the Global North, 
and it just makes it more difficult to conduct some of the researches that they want to do uh, with the guidelines that has been set. So I think that was the, the, the presumption that we went in with, and I think it might be completely wrong. And I think that's why we need to have a group of folks sit together and try to figure out what, what is the right, whether the changes need to be done, what changes need to be done, how do, you go up, uh, how do you go about making those changes. But I think you're right. I think those are two different categories. One is the local people doing the research, one is the other one is like international folks helping them do research. I think the international folks going and helping them, I think that was also brought up last time. There's a lot of difficulty in that happening too uh, when international folks come in and help doing research out there. I think not only uh, like once the research is done, dissemination, but also like during the research process, like that there is some sort of like a bias, like uh, trying to show that we are capable of performing to the extent that you really want us to do. So I think that that all all that goes into factor when 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 this this uh, sort of relationship happens. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Great question. Thank you. Any other any other questions or, or thoughts? Okay. So uh, these are we're just going to go through some questions here um, to get your feedback on them and uh, what your thoughts are about them. And we don't want you to, to answer the question. <laughs> that's not what that's not what we want. We just want to hear what your thoughts are about the way the question is framed and the kinds of responses that are uh, provided here. So, question one uh, is: What ethical principle do you believe principles do you believe are most challenging? Uh, to address when conducting global emergency medicine research. Um, and then we are going to hopefully ask for some type of ranking um, or perhaps uh, potentially just have them select like the most important uh, or, two, or two most important. And, and we uh, purposely put uh, respect for culture out there uh, because it's definitely not one of the Benmont principles. So, so I think, uh, uh, and I think uh, we, and we don't want you to answer like if you look through the, the questionnaire, it's basically, do you think that's an appropriate question? Uh, just give us a yes and no. Uh, and then uh, if, if you think that's not an appropriate question, I think let's, let's discuss why, why you think that's not an appropriate question. Like, do you, do you, go ahead, I, I think. I, I'll, I, I don't, I don't want to hog the microphone, although I no. have trouble <laughs> keeping my mouth shut. But I'm, I'm curious to hear what others think also. I, I, I really appreciate Shaman's question, because I think the like, who is this for and what counts as global EM research mm -hmm. are really important issues to tease out. Um, and it, that question changed how I think about this question, which I appreciate. Because um, I, like, I think that my answer as an American doing research in an LMIC is probably very different than the answer of an African doing research in Africa or mm -hmm. an African trying to do research in America for that matter. Um, I don't like the way this question is worded. And I, I think it's the ranking because it, like, my, my assumption is that then you're gonna say, well, these are the top three that are the important ones, and then the other ones aren't important, where I think that all of these seem important to me. And I think maybe the way that I would have done this is to have five separate questions where each of those is like a Likert scale of, oh. is this important, not important, you know, or is this like adequately addressed by existing mm -hmm. um, guidelines, or is this something that we need more attention to, yeah. to resolve for these sorts of Settings. So you're not directly ranking them against each other, but you could still quantify, you know, how they seem, how important they seem based on the Likert response. Yeah, makes a lot of sense. Thank you. That's really good. I mean, it is a challenging question, right? Because as you say, these are all important concepts. None, none of this is unimportant. Um, but what we were interested in, one of the things we're interested in, is learning, as you say, uh, the differences between for example, an American investigator doing research in a different country and the local investigator doing. How does the, um, how would the ranking or the perception of which are the most difficult uh, ethical principles to address, how would that differ between someone from another country doing research versus someone locally doing research? So I think that's an interesting question, you know, that we're hoping to get some information on. And having a diverse group of people will hopefully give us some, you know, idea about that. Great, thank you. Any other thoughts on this, on this question? Okay, so, um, and this is a similar kind of question, so you might, uh, we might apply the same uh, suggestion to this. What's the most challenging virtue to address uh, in EM physicians when conducting global emergency uh, medicine research? So, I'm not sure the wording on this is perfect, but um, I think, they're looking at it kind of in, inversely, but rather than looking at challenges, looking at virtues. Um, 
and which ones, and these are virtues. Again, we recognize that you could probably come up with other options here, uh, and this would not be it. Uh, so that these are not definitive. They are based on kind of the existing literature in the area, but certainly people would have an opportunity to suggest other virtues or challenges that they think are important and worthy of And, and this is actually an interesting question because it came out of an SAEM guideline paper. I think it was in 2016 about virtues, using virtues for doing ethical consideration while doing EM research. And uh, it, it truly started having me, uh, and actually the group, and. I, Sorry for, for those who came in late. I think the group consists only of me and James who are American. The rest of them are non-American. Unfortunately, <laughs> SAEM doesn't let them zoom in. So, like, so, so we, we have to represent them. But uh, the, thoughts, the, the, the thoughts that go into, uh, into, uh, into this is, is, is basically a very much global south than, than global north. So um, yeah, I think, uh, uh, so like, the question was based out of that study, and I think it was brought up by Evelyn Hedy from from the Beirut. I think she said like she really liked the the thought of uh, using virtue uh, when uh, to address some of the the, uh, the issues. And I think uh, that's a tough one because we don't think like that. And uh, and it really got me thinking like I, I truly don't think of research ethics along those lines, uh, but it is something that uh, they they think about. So. I think so. I just put it out there. So, is that like go ahead? Hi, um, I was just very confused what you're trying to address with the question like, what is a challenging virtue and does a virtue need to be addressed? And I, yeah, I'm just kind of like, what was the intent behind this, this statement, or is it more which of these virtues is most important to be an ethical researcher? So I, I think which of these uh, virtues should be considered when you're doing ethical, like when you're considering ethics, which of these virtues should okay. be considered? I think I, the challenging I think part challenge, is yeah. throwing me off. Yeah. It's maybe adjusting yeah. that. Yeah. It's a little the, more understandable. The, the wording can be yeah. improved for sure. Thank you. Yeah. Um, yeah. This is not related to this, and you might be getting to this later, but hmm. I think the whole idea of doing like empirical bioethics research and actually involving patients and communities to do research of how research should be conducted ethically. Mm -hmm. It's a, it's very understudied and undervalued. It's even more understudied and undervalued when there are fewer resources to do, mm -hmm. to have the luxury of doing bioethics research. So I was wondering how you're incorporating input and having this be patient and community centered. I, I totally realize that, you know, some of these research questions, even talking about virtue ethics, you need to have a certain level of expertise, but at the same time, lots of empirical bioethicists mm -hmm. do involve, you know, and get data to drive how ethical policies and protocols are developed. So I'm not sure if you're talking about that later, but I'd love to hear how you're involving the actual patients. Um, that will be involved in, in emergency care research or possibly previously were involved mm -hmm. in emergency care research for themselves or their family? Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, that, and that goes to speak, it speaks to the constitution of the, the people involved in the Delphi process, right? And uh, also the working group, for that matter, um, recruiting people that do have those experiences and perspectives that are different. And so the, the con and you may, I don't know if you, what part of the slide you guys came in, uh, if you saw that, but we were, we're planning to be inclusive of people who have, you know, who are patients or who have been patients and they are not ethicists, they are not researchers, you know. Um, and part of that would require for everyone to be on a level playing field, you'd have to define what do these terms mean because most people might not know what these terms mean. I'm not sure if everybody <laughs> you know, that I work with in my, off, in my uh, ED would be able to define these terms. So I think it's unfair to ask people to rank or otherwise you know, comment on things that they don't understand. So we'd have to have some education in there and an agreement you know, on what these words mean and that would be part of our definition for, for this process, you know, for de defining how we're going to um, evaluate this question is, yeah. is the education. I, I think we spent like two days trying to figure out how we can pick layperson in this working group. And I think it, it became really challenging. Like how, how do you, like if, if you create a working group, whose responsibility, like how do you figure out who's going to be the layperson in that group? Like in, in, in an ethics committee, it's pretty easy. It's, it's, a, it's a voluntary position, you come in. But when you're doing a Delphi model, uh, a working group, you have a clinician, you have an ethicist, but we really want to have the layman there. You want to have the person from the community out there. 
but I think this is a question for you. Like, like if you had to figure out how to get that person, like, would you ask the the person from the the like the lead clinician from the working group? Okay, you you, you pick somebody from from uh, your community who would be a part of this working group. I think, and it became really difficult to to sort of conceptualize how to get that because I, I agree with you that we truly need to have that representation because that's truly going to give us good feedback about like how it's going to be conducted. So, mm -hmm. yep. Sorry, just a logistics question too. Is this going to be all done in English? So, as well? and then the challenge that, that just further makes that challenge of getting the lay person, I think, mm -hmm. more. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Good. Yeah. No, no. It's uh, this is definitely something that we have to think. It's it's an easy Delphi model can easily be converted to uh, multiple languages. But I think if we, if we do get lay people, it's very important to have the local language as, as a translated on that. Yeah, I was thinking that, like when you said lay people initially, I was thinking like it's gonna be really hard, like if, even if you're you know, approaching family members in the emergency department, that it's gonna be hard to get those people to follow through with multiple Delphi rounds because mm -hmm. they're gonna go on with their lives and may not be in, as invested in the project as somebody who works in the field. Yeah. I, I think that, I, I, I was thinking about it a little bit more as, as we were talking that, you know, and so most of the international work that I do is in Ethiopia mm -hmm. where everybody's religious. What, whatever flavor of religion they are, everybody, everybody's religious. And I think that they see the American sort of secular humanist separation of religion from, you know, professional life or, or work as kind of silly and arbitrary. Mm -hmm. And I think that like, there, there definitely are community leaders, religious leaders, in most parts of the world who would have really valuable contributions. Hmm. You know, I think when we talk about like what does brain death mean or not mean in Ethiopia, like that's a religious question, not a medical ethics question in the in the Ethiopian framing of things. Um, so I think th those sorts of people may be easier to engage and their their contribution may be really valued by your your global partners because those are people who they look to yeah. as as authorities also. Like, yeah, and they're, they're really content experts in their culture, so that's perfect, yeah. And then also our, sort of our separation of biomedical ethics from religious ethics, I think it is not a separation that exists in many parts of the world. Yeah, good point, thank you. Yeah, I love that. So, so what I've taken down is a religious leader, cultural leader, uh, somebody who could represent the community, like one person, yeah, go ahead. Um, I was wondering if maybe, because uh, I was concerned about power differentials in something like a working group, so perhaps doing a focus group or even just in-depth interviews with lay people or you know people that have had that lived experience of being a patient or had a family member who was a participant in research, and that might be a better way to address some of these, um, and also have it be more context-focused, because if you bring in someone who's being you know, into a working group that may be led by, you know, someone from the Middle East, but you, even if everything's translated, there are so many layers of context and nuance mm -hmm. that maybe doing a few focused interviews or just a small focus group discussion and then bringing that feedback to the actual working group um, because the working group almost definitely will have power dynamics that mm -hmm. will influence, you know, what that representative would say. Yeah. Very good point. And, and if we applied that idea to like the Delphi process, that might take care of that issue of people being involved in you know, iterative, iterative rounds if we just in, uh, used input from them in an interview type way, yeah. I love that idea. So I, I like coming up with a list of questions that are going to be addressed by the focus group and then bringing it back to the working group who then continue. Great, thank you. So um, again, question multiple choice questions, but um, in, in your opinion, what are the key challenges or ethical dilemmas that researchers face in conducting global EM research? Um, and again, these are all important concepts, but I think you know the key here is trying to identify some trends and um, what specific people uh, or potentially groups of people uh, feel are the, the key challenges. So it goes a little bit back to the first question, but different types of, of, of challenges here. Any additional thoughts, or is kind of the, you can probably, there's a theme here, right? So you can you probably get the same comments. Um, this is a uh, kind of a open-ended 
question, which might be more suitable. Um, how can researchers ensure that informed consent is obtained and respected in global EM research, uh, especially in situations where language or cultural barriers may exist? Love to hear. I, I, say, I, I can tell you have a lot of input on this one. So. Well, no, I, I bet the child and I are going to say something different. I'm, I'm looking forward to hearing her perspective yeah. also. Um, one thing that I found really interesting, again, in my very limited work in one specific place, is the value that we place on informed consent in America mm -hmm. being very different than the value that's placed on informed consent in other parts of the world. And it doesn't mean that we're wrong, but it does definitely mean that I'm bringing my American values to the table when I say, I need to read this two-page document verbatim to you and make sure that you understand what it says before you sign it. And I'm not gonna proceed with research if, if I don't think that you under, like, I, I think a lot of times, at, at least in Ethiopia, like patients are just like, you're the doctor, you, you know, you, you do what's right. Mm -hmm. And I, like, why are you asking me how to do your job? <laughs> and, and even the physicians are like, they, of course they consent, they don't care. Like, yeah. why, like, you're just gonna like confuse and belabor things and lose your opportunity to actually get to the research if you like alienate them by throwing a lot of jargon and, and um, barriers at yeah. you. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I don't know what the answer to that is. But yeah, I, I think it's like, yeah, I don't know what the answer to that is. It's along similar lines, um, I think, we, again, I think, I know you said it, like, we've exported, like, Global North ethics uh -huh. to all these countries, right, ethical boards. Like, informed consent, I think, is a very Western, US-centric way of doing things, right? Different cultures, like, you just don't tell people things, and that's just how it is. Or you, again, are the clinician, so you're the one that decides what's important and not. Mm -hmm. Also, I think we're introducing a whole new concept to people, and being like, hey, we have 10 minutes. I'm going to read this two-page document, and you sign if you don't. But you understand, right? And they're gonna say yes. Mm -hmm. You're not gonna understand it. Like I, when I've done informed consent, I don't understand half of what it says. Like, right. like I mean, I'm, I'm, if I read it at all, I'm just like whatever. Like sign enough things. But like, yeah. I, I think it's an opportunity to redefine informed consent mm. in a global context. Mm. So maybe a better way to phrase or think about this question would be how how do different groups view how do different groups view informed consent? and how do they define it, and is it relevant in different cultures or not? Yeah, you're saying it's an opportunity to define informed consent. Yeah, I think that's great. No, I, go ahead. I love that, like, same experience like y'all have in Ethiopia, I have it in India, so you go to the villages and then, I, I don't even think that the village panchayat reads it. I think they, they mm -hmm. sort of throw it off uh, like garbage. And, and then uh, we basically run the research without consent. So uh, yeah, we have ahead. a question over. Well, just a comment. I think uh -huh. it's all probably all very specific to like the location that you're in. Because I imagine mm -hmm. if you're like out in like rural areas where there's not a lot of like research at baseline, and it's just like mm -hmm. you coming in. I totally agree. I think in a lot of like low middle income countries, like the doctor role is just seen. It's almost like this paternalistic like mm -hmm. feeling where it's like whatever you say, I, who am I to question it? Yeah. Um, but I will say that through my global health fellowship, I worked in Botswana a lot, and they actually have like the Ministry of Health is like really great about like having lots of standards in place from a local standpoint. Um, so when I was getting my IRB, it was like first it had to go through all local like the university, the Ministry of Health, um, and then it went through like Penn and CHOP and all these other places. Um, and what I will say is like what I found really helpful was like the research assistant that I had was like a local person mm -hmm. who spoke Botswana, and even though my research was on healthcare workers in Botswana, like, I thought it was really helpful to have somebody local because it's like, it's not just me coming from the US, mm -hmm. it's somebody that's also believing in this research and not kind of like a part of their community. And so people just felt like more comfortable. So I think just like, it, it always goes back to like having local community stakeholders and mm -hmm. people who like represent the culture of the community who are also buying into this, so. Such a good point, thank you. Thank you for bringing that up. Um, I, I, th I think great point, but I think, uh, I, I, I agree, I, I do the same thing when I go there, but I think that the point remains is that is the individual patient understanding the informed consent. Mm -hmm. I, I think that's where the question comes up. Like, I, I think as, as a group, like the, the organization is understanding the process, they understand what we want from them, but does that individual patient really care? Uh, or mm -hmm. does it right, them? yeah. Uh, question five. Well, no. Oh, go ahead. Real, uh, I can't yeah. do a math show. <laughs> no, that's great, um, go well, ahead. While you're, you're, so I think two things about that, maybe. One is that I, I think that 
it's really hard to get informed consent. Even in the US, it's hard to get informed mm -hmm. consent that's not coercive. Where you're saying, like, you're in the emergency department in right. pain, begging for morphine, sign this, like, I promise it's not gonna affect your care, but sign this consent form. Yeah. <laughs> like, I, you know, I, I think that when you have somebody in an emergency department in mm -hmm. a low resource setting, at seeking emergency care, it's really hard to get informed consent. It's really not coerced by the, you know, I'm the white guy from America who's coming in asking you to sign a consent form. I promise it's not gonna affect your care. Like, yeah. I, it's really hard to get around the options. So many reasons why that might be suspect, yeah. right? Yeah. But you know, maybe there's a, an opportunity or a, an example from like the community-based participatory, mm -hmm. participatory research boards. Yeah. So like at, uh, at Penn when I was there, they were doing research about pre-hospital care for trauma patients, where it, like you really couldn't realistically get informed consent at that moment. Um, but they, you know, convened sort of ethics committees, boards from the community mm -hmm. to talk about overall from the community perspective when you're not in the middle of a, a disaster situation, like what would seem ethical and appropriate to you? Mm -hmm. When is it appropriate to waive informed consent at the moment because overall with the, the values and principles of the community, this is something that people would think was ethical to do. Yeah, that's great, thank you. She has a comment, I think. Um, something I've seen in some of the research I've been a part of too is we talk, mm. you guys are talking a lot about that blurring of clinician and researcher. Mm. Yeah. I think um, when thinking about consent, that blurring of researcher and community member, of if you're working in small communities, especially um, like having that personal connection to mm -hmm. not being a challenge. Yeah, that's not great. Not just consent. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, we, I think we have time for a few more of these questions. I really appreciate the feedback. This is exactly what we wanted, guys, so thank you so much for giving us this information. Uh, what, what role do you believe that community engagement and partnership play in ensuring ethical conduct in global EM research? I mean, that was, you guys have all been talking about that, so thank you. Um, and how, yeah, exactly, it looks planted. Um, how can researchers effectively engage with local communities and ensure that their voices are heard? So we've heard about you know, having an advocate or you know, even a research assistant or somebody who's like local and knows the culture, um, you know, mitigating that and the biases that we would have going into a situation like that. But do you have other thoughts about this or uh, ways sure. that we can tease out answers? Group here has many thoughts. I see, it's great, <laughs> we love it. Thank you for coming. So I think um, what Steph was saying is that this, I think, is really, would be amenable to like focus groups and, and mm -hmm. key informant kind of interviews, um, especially because I think that if we're talking about the patient or the community, they might not be comfortable mm -hmm. talking to external people coming in. They might not be honest. They might say what we think yeah. they want to say. They won't be comfortable asking the questions that, oh, hey, I don't really know what this means. Like, what are you talking about? Yeah. Um, so I think these questions might be better served in that setting. In a focus group. Um, and then different kind of levels and groups um, so people can be as comfortable as possible. Because yeah. uh, I think the other flip side of all this is like to mitigate any sort of punitive action or any sort of mm. undue, like unforeseen consequences for them to participating or being honest, right? Yeah. I think that's always a risk. Um, I hope that it's not, but there's always unintended consequences, that's but to mitigate as many as we can. Very good, thank you. <clears throat> okay. Um, question six, what are the most critical factors to consider when determining the appropriate balance between potential risks and benefits uh, for participants with elevated baseline risk? And how could these factors be standardized across different healthcare contexts? It's a pretty broad question, I realize. Um, we're trying to get at what people would consider to be the most critical factors. Um, but we've been talking about this already, right? So you're a vulnerable person in a vulnerable situation, and someone's coming to you talking about risks and benefits. So um, I, I think and, that this is the, the topic. Other, other, the other thought was like, does this question really need to be here? I, I think that is the other thing. We, we put in a bunch of questions, but truly, does a working group need to ans uh, answer this? Like, the most critical factor to consider when determining appropriate balance. I, I, I do feel it's important, but I think, what are your thoughts? Like, do you think that's important for? You know, I, I think that there's a, a nuance to the benefit in terms of like, if you, you know, if you're gonna test a drug on me and then 
that drug's not going to be available in the context where I work. Or even if you're going to build healthcare infrastructure mm -hmm. to allow you to test a drug on me, and then when the study's over, take away that healthcare infrastructure, um, the, the sort of shades how, how I think about risk and benefit in lower resource settings compared to like, there's already an existing system and you know, some reasonable expectation that if a medicine comes onto the market in the US, yeah. that the patients are gonna have, you know, mm -hmm. some ability to access that medication that was tested on them or, you know, tested on people similar to them. Yeah, thank you. Great. Um, and this is going into blurring the roles. We just talked about this between clinician and researcher. It was mentioned between researcher and community member is another, you know, key thing to consider here. Um, and, you know, in fact, in many, I'm sure in many resource scarce um, environments, the clinician is the researcher, the researcher is the clinician, right? So it, they're the same person. Um, and so how could these strategies be standardized to ensure that the conduct is ethical and transparent? We've talked about this a little bit. Any, any additional thoughts or reactions to this question? Uh, question eight, which, which criteria should be prioritized to ensure pay, fair uh, pay, participant selection this is the key part of this in trials or studies, particularly in contexts where they may be limited resources or specific eligibility criteria. Dr. Kumar mentioned that in some cultures it's perfectly acceptable for someone else to just say these 10 people are going to be in your study and that's it. Um, so how could we standardize the criteria to be you know, uh, inclusive and, and have a, an equitable definition for um, fair participant selection? Any thoughts on that? I realize these are really broad questions, but thank you for any insights you have. And again, I think uh, the, the question is not uh, for us to answer them. I think the question is like, is it an appropriate question for the working group? Mm -hmm. And uh, the, the way we want to, uh, like, uh, I know we are a little short of time. I think we have like four minutes left. Yeah. So I think the way we want to do it is like, we wanted to keep this open-ended question for the first phase. And then when we get the responses from the, the first phase, we then create the, the choices for the second phase. Mm -hmm. uh, so that they can, they can then uh, give us a, an answer in the second phase. Thank you. Right. Um, okay, and then question nine, how could ec equitable access to healthcare research be ensured for underserved or marginalized populations? What strategies can be standardized to address systemic barriers and promote inclusivity in healthcare research? So is this something that you would consider to be important enough that we would include this question with our group? Um, I think, you know, that's all, like, we talk a lot about equity and inclusivity. Mm. I just don't know how much that translates to our colleagues overseas mm. and to a different country. I, I don't, I think it does, and I think there's versions of this all over the world. And I know, you know, it's like a high-income country kind of leading it. I mean, with a working group that's around the world, I just don't know necessarily if the terminology mm. is as... Inclusive, if you will. Yeah. <laughs> that's right. Yeah. Um, no. I know other, a lot of other cultures look at us and they're confused by our preoccupation our with certain things. So I, think, and, I think a big yeah. part of this is going to have to be really defining these terms mm. very specifically and what you mean because yeah. I think um, there's going to be a lot of confusion yeah. into what people think they mean. Very good. Thank you. Yeah. I, you know, I, I think that it'll be helpful to, you know, I think this is a great like focus group question, mm -hmm. but I think it'll be really helpful to pilot it, you know, with a, a focus group somewhere mm -hmm. and see what questions make sense or need to be rewarded, you know, because I, I feel like some of these questions are questions that make sense to us as like an academic researcher audience, but like, like if you ask me what strateg strategies can be standardized, like I can think of some strategies and then say which ones I think are the most useful or like, you know, different methods of ensuring equitable ac access, like, if I'm not a medical researcher, that like I might not even know what you mean with, mm -hmm. with that sort of a question. So yeah. Trying to figure out ways to sort of de de jargonize that. Yeah. In a way that, like, um, yeah. I, I, but I like I think the trialing those those questions with the target audience mm -hmm. to see what questions just sort of get you blank stares and what questions <laughs> conversation yeah. would be really helpful. That's really good. Thank you. Um. I don't know, we're really out of time here. Um, I think, I think 
That's an important question. Yeah, I think this is probably the one to end with. So uh, where do you think that the governance, um, in other words, establishing guidelines, policies, protocols for global EM research ethics should originate from? And as Dr. Kumar mentioned, last year we asked people this question and about half of them thought it was, should be completely local and half of them thought it should be international guidelines. And maybe everybody's right and everybody's wrong. And you know, I think that's what we're trying to find out if you have thoughts about this kind of a question being a focus for our group. Yeah. Um, I think that it should go from like the bottom up because mm -hmm. I feel like the local population is really the one that you're working with. They're the ones that are gonna be most directly impacted, like based on the scope of the study. But most times you start local. And I just think that like, you need to come up with like guidelines that are most relevant to your like local population, your local governance. And then you should go further up because I think the higher up you get, it's more standardized most often. I mean, that's not like a steadfast rule. Um, but I actually think that like it's E, like more than one level because you need those checks and balances in place. Um, and sometimes the local government, like kind of like what you're saying in like a panchayat, like maybe you're not gonna have like a, you know, IRB and ethics board that's really gonna review stuff, but you just try to do the best you can with like the infrastructure that's in place. But I do think that multiple levels, um, it's not like foolproof, but I do think that it like at least safeguards against like a lot of like any potential like ethical issues that could arise. Thank you, that's really good. Is, is there anything else that you want to add in that list? You know, I, I, I agree with, with you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I agree with property. Um, I, I think that, you know, I, it certainly needs to come from a local level, but you also sort of need to have something that's international mm -hmm. and that you're not sort of reinventing the wheel in every, in every setting. Um, and, and then ultimately, like, I mean, for re at least for research in Ethiopia, whatever guidelines you have need to be endorsed by the, the Federal Ministry of Health. Mm -hmm. So, I, you know, I think coming up with something that is sort of, you know, has broad input and that is universally applicable and nationally or regionally endorsed yeah. is probably the, the way to get it so that it actually is meaningful to everybody. I, I do sort of need to run. The one other thing I was going to mention, um, that I feel like it comes up, it doesn't come up enough when we talk about global health research ethics, is the relationship between the high and low income country researchers. Mm -hmm. Because I think that there's a lot of risk of coercion and exploitation mm -hmm. in how we treat our LMIC collaborators. Um, you know, not, it, it really pains me to see studies about, you know, like emergency medicine in whatever country published by eight authors from this American university. Yeah. Yeah. With, with no, you know, no participation from the, the local, the yeah, local researchers or libraries. Um, but I think you know all those questions about now non malfeasance and justice mm -hmm. and and really, you know, are your collaborators really consenting to collaborate with you, or are they being coerced into participating yeah. in your project? That, like a lot of those questions apply on on that other level in a very similar way. And are they are they equally benefiting from the research? Yeah, you know, or is this all going to be published and presented by a bunch of high-income country researchers. And they'll never see it. Yeah. They'll never see the results or learn the results. So, no, we really appreciate your feedback. I'm sorry we're over time. We really appreciate it. Obviously, we're very early in this process. So mm -hmm. thank you so much for this very valuable input. And uh, I think it's being recorded. So um, we'll be reviewing this tape over and over, I'm sure. Uh, yeah. any, any last comments or questions, Dr. Kumar? No, I, I think I had the, the, the poll everywhere, but I think we, we got everything done yeah. in my writing, so I don't think we need to go into that. Yeah, those are all the, the poll everywhere uh, answers. So it's actually pretty impressive, the, the points that we have. So it's, yeah. So a lot of yeses, so that's good. That's, yeah. That makes us feel okay. thank, thank you for <laughs> your time, and I'll, I'll connect with Shama, and uh, we'll definitely talk more. Okay, thank you. Thanks so much. Thanks so much. Have a great day. Thank you.